All right, so we're talking about you having the ability to make good ethical decisions. Fantastic, that's wonderful. We need to see what we can do to give you that ability. All right, so you're an engineer. You're gonna be making engineering sorts of ethical decisions. Let's talk about some situations in which engineers had to make ethical decisions. Now, before we get into this discussion, I need to give you a heads up, and I apologize because all of these case studies are very, very boring. At no point in time is there a dash from the building at midnight with a suitcase full of photographic evidence that you went up to the boss's office and you cracked open the safe and you pulled him out and now you're dashing off the building to go meet with the very attractive DEA agent who's, uh, well, no, not gonna happen. Nor will you have to rappel on a rope down through the center elevator shaft in the middle of the building so you can get access to an air duct, so no. None of that. Those are exciting things. Those are glamorous things. Ethical decision making has nothing to do with any of those. Sadly enough, ethical decision making sneaks up on you. You're doing your job. You're doing exactly what the company hired you to do. And then all of a sudden you discover, much to your chagrin, you've got a decision to make that's going to have ramifications. And remember, we've talked about this. The ramifications sometimes are all bad. <laughs> There's no good choice to make. So I want you to keep that in mind as we talk about these case studies. Put yourself in the place of the person who had to make the decision. And the question is, what decision would you have made? All right, let's take a look at our first one. Infant respirators. <sighs> This is a critical tool. So it basically, infant respirators breathe for infants when they can't breathe by themselves. Okay? Sam Wilson was an experienced engineer, and he was employed by a company called MedTech. MedTech made a wide range of products, including infant respirators. Now, Sam did not work on the infant respirator line. Okay? But he was acknowledged as being a really, really good engineer. So one day, one of his colleagues came up to him and said, hey, look, we're having a problem with this infant respirator. Would you be willing to take a look at it? Well, Sam's a good guy, not a problem. Hey, look, I'll find some time, I'll take a look at it. So he took a look at the infant respirator, and what he determined was that there was a relief valve that was designed to basically protect the, the unit against overpressurization, but it was being incorrectly placed when it was put on the infant's chest. It was a design flaw. They built the thing wrong. All right, so you've got a challenge here, Sam, don't you? You've discovered that a product that's arguably a very critical product that does a good thing has a flaw. What are you gonna do? What Sam did was he hunted down the manager who was in charge of the infant respirator product line. And he said, hey, look, you know, I took a look at your design. There's this thing that's a really clearly, I mean, it's not even an if, it's really wrong. I need you to make a change. Manager said what every single manager in the world says, Sam, thank you so much for bringing that to my attention. Wow, I don't know how that slipped past us. I appreciate it. What I'm gonna do is take your information, I'm gonna pass it on to your appropriate parties, and we're gonna get right on this, Sam. Thank you so much. Sam felt good, he'd done the right thing. Life is good. You know, time goes on, and you know, someday Sam goes, hey, I wonder if they've made that change. He goes and checks out a unit and he discovers the exact same situation. Okay, the relief valve is still messed up. So he goes back to the manager. He says, hey, you know, we talked. You promised you'd make a change. You clearly have not made a change. My request is, hey, can you make that change? Sam took it one step farther this time though, right? He said, look, if you don't do something to change this right off the bat, Okay, I, as an engineer, have to do something. I'm going to have to go report it to the regulatory authority who's in charge of infant respirators. And the manager said what every manager always says. Sam, I apologize. I got busy. It must have slipped my mind. Thank you so much for bringing this up again. You know, I'm, I'm writing a note right here, right now. I'm going to get right on this. I do apologize. Sam, there's no reason for you to go talk to anybody. We are going to take care of this. You're, you know, you pointed out to me last time. You're exactly correct. It's just my schedule got busy. This time it won't happen. I appreciate you coming to me. Sam said, okay. Feeling justified? Feeling vindicated? Sam goes back to his desk. 
And the next day he was fired. Fired? What's up with that? I mean, Sam did the right thing. He discovered that there was a flaw in the product. He reported it to the right person, and they canned him. Oh. So that doesn't seem very fair, does it? It doesn't. Welcome to the world of engineering ethics. <laughs> it's not fair out here, is it? So what caused Sam to get fired? Well, a lot of different things, probably. But definitely, when he said he was going to report it to a regulatory agency, I think a thousand alarm bells went off in his company. So what happened? The manager he talked to probably went and talked to his boss. Alarm bells going off more and more. His boss probably talked to either Sam's boss's boss, or maybe even the big man at the company. They said, listen, for whatever reason, we can't be having one of our employees going to a regulatory body and complaining about one of our products. We need to do something to put an end to this right now. Now, there was a lot of ways to go about solving that one, but apparently they decided to take the expedient measure, and so they fired Sam. Hmm. Well, you know, so there's no question here. I think Sam did the ethical thing. Okay? Not a question about that whatsoever. I think Sam was a fool. I think when he played basically his nuclear trump card and said, listen, either you fix this or else I'm going to go to a regulatory agency, I think that's where he made a huge mistake. Of, of course the company's going to react strongly when you say something like that. There must have been other ways he could have gone about doing this. He could have reported it to the manager again. He could have reported it to his boss. There's probably some sort of safety or quality control person in there. You know, it sounds like Sam took sort of the easy way out, threatening the manager in charge of the product. Look, I don't disagree that he's correct. There's no question about that whatsoever. However, I disagree with the way that he went about accomplishing what he wanted to accomplish. And as engineers, I think that's critical for us to understand. Look, when we encounter an ethical decision-making system, we probably identify what we think is the right answer. No question about that whatsoever. We're pretty good about that, right? But once we start to execute on that, we need to keep in mind that our goal is to get the company to do the right thing. It's not to get ourselves fired. It's to get the company to do the right thing. And so the actions that you take have to be moving you closer to having that occur. All right, next case. Software. So Jim Warner was a senior software systems expert. He was hired by a company called NewSoft. And it was a little startup company. Uh, and you know, if you've ever worked at a little startup company, you know exactly what that environment's like. It's exciting, it's fast moving, you've got no requirements, you've got no documented processes, your job is a flexible thing, what it was yesterday is not what it is today, not what it will be tomorrow. It's fast moving, great, great place to be. Well, now, here was the challenge though. So, Jim was there, but he soon learned that the product, the core product, and remember it's a startup, so they probably only had one product, was based on proprietary software for which the company, NewSoft, did not have a license. Hmm. So what does that actually mean? What it means is, for example, let's say you wrote a program that ran on top of the Windows operating system. And then you went out and started selling Windows operating system and your program to another company so that they could run it, right? Great, that's fantastic. But if you didn't pay Microsoft for the copy of the operating system, you would be doing exactly the same thing that NewSoft was doing. So Jim had detected this problem. Now look, it's a startup, so it's entirely possible that somebody forgot about this. <laughs> so he went and he spoke with the company president. Now that sounds really impressive. I'm going to go talk to the president. Generally in a startup, though, if you only have four or five people, the president is working side by side with everybody else. So anyway, he talked to the company president about the matter, and he was assured that the situation would be rectified. And once again, we know exactly how that conversation went, right? Hey, boss, guess what? I just discovered that the software that we're using, we don't have a license for. What? How'd that happen? Hey, not a problem. I'll take care of it. End of story. Now, Jim went on and kept working with the software that NewSoft was working with. He discovered other instances of the same practice. In other words, they had taken software from a lot of different places that they did not have licenses for, and they'd glommed it together, and that was their product. Now, good news. Their cost for their product was a lot lower than it had to be because they weren't paying any licensing fees, right? All right, so Jim went back and he said, ah, this is going to eventually kill us. People are going to realize that we're using software that we don't have licenses for. We have to solve this problem now. But nothing changed, okay? And in the end, Jim was fired because he had, he, his final final promise to the company was, hey, either we fix this problem or else I'm going to go out and tell the companies whose software we're effectively stealing. All right. 
So we find ourselves in a situation, was Jim right? Yeah, he probably was right. I don't disagree with that whatsoever. They shouldn't be using software they don't have licenses for. So Jim go out and threaten to go out to these other companies and tell them what they're doing? Uh, don't know. That's a tricky one. I mean, look, it's a startup, right? This is a very small company. They should not be doing it. There's no question about that whatsoever. They should fix the problem. Seems like Jim was working really hard. It seems like there had to be another way to accomplish this, right? You know, one point is, is that Jim could have gone to the president and said, hey, let me give you an example of what we're doing. He could have given an example where the new soft product was being used by somebody else and new soft wasn't being paid for it. You know, that would have struck a chord with the president going, wait, that's not fair. Bingo. Gotcha. And that's exactly what we're doing. There had to be other ways of doing it. When Jim got fired, now here's an interesting ethical issue. When Jim got fired, what happened to the problem? Did that magically cure the problem of them using unlicensed software? No. It just means the, the complainer was gone. There was nobody else to set off the alarm bells. Oh my God, if this had been like a public safety issue, what would have happened? You know, people could have been hurt later on when something just blew up or what have you. So I think Jim's decision to threaten to notify victimized companies was probably a poor decision on his part. And he really didn't do a good service to the people who were being, um, having their software sold incorrectly. All right, another example. All right, so Will Morgan is a licensed electrical engineer. Fantastic. And he does jobs for a state university. Sounds like a pretty good gig, OK? And it is a good gig. His problem, though, is that his immediate manager is an architect. No problems there. They've got a very, very good working relationship. Where things get sticky is that the architect's manager okay, is an administrator by the name of John Tite. Okay? Very good administrator. No technical background whatsoever. All right, you know, we've all, we've all been in that situation, right? Where you're working with somebody who has no knowledge <laughs> about what you do. Uh, and unfortunately, if they're in a decision-making uh, situation, you end up living with their decisions. So, yeah, been there, done that, right? Well, Mr. Tight had, unfortunately, a fatal personality flaw. His fatal personality flaw is that he constantly underestimated projects. He didn't ask for enough money. And then, when the project was underway, he would show up and he'd start to put pressure on the people doing the work to cut corners. He'd ask them to cut corners because he simply didn't have the money to pay them because he'd done a lousy job of estimating the project in the first place. All right. So anyway, Will was working on a particular project. What they were doing is they were renovating a warehouse, big empty box type of thing, and they were converting it to use some storage space into official office space. OK, I mean, that seems pretty common. You're going to carve off part of it, turn it into cube, cube land. OK, that's good stuff like that. Now, part of this project required for the installation of emergency exit lights and, of course, a fire detection system. You know, required by state law and just basically good sense, right? Well, guess what? As was always the case, Tite had underestimated this particular project which means there wasn't enough money to pay for everything. And they'd put in most of the stuff they were going to put in. What they had not put in yet, or what had not purchased, was emergency exit lights and, of course, the relatively expensive fire detection system. So Tite shows up and says, ah, let's just go ahead and delete those requirements. We don't need emergency exit lights, and we don't need a fire detection system. OK, I mean, it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't take that good of an engineer to realize that that's bad, bad, bad.